namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa <coughs> Okay, we will continue now with the study of the Satipatthana Sutta. And now, we, last time we completed, we completed the study of the section on contemplation of feelings. And now we come to Chitanupasana. This is contemplation of mind. And now contemplation of mind, it seems to me, develops quite naturally out of the contemplation of feelings. Because we saw last week that feelings are of three primary types. There's pleasant feeling, painful feeling, and what's called neutral feeling, feeling that's neither painful nor pleasant. And so, in regard to these three types of feelings, there's a natural tendency for one or another of the three unwholesome roots or unwholesome mental defilements to arise. And so, in regard to pleasant feeling, Okay, so in regard to pleasant feeling, there's a tendency for, when pleasant feeling arises, for the unwholesome tendency, there's a a tendency for the unwholesome inclination or disposition of mind of, we call raga, which can be translated sometimes lust, but it's not only this strong, powerful lust, but it Sometimes it takes the form of an attachment or clinging to the pleasant feeling or simply a liking for it, a delighting in it. And that delighting becomes an underlying attachment which eventually it clouds over the mind and then it becomes an obstacle to the opening or freedom of the mind. And then when painful feeling arises, then there is a tendency for the unwholesome disposition, the unwholesome quality of aversion to arise. This is the, we call, uh, in Pali we call this dosa. Dosa means it has a wide range of implications everything ranging from fierce hatred and anger to even a subtle disliking, annoyance or irritation. And then when there's neither a conspicuous, neither a prominent pleasant feeling nor a prominent painful feeling, then what is occurring is a neutral feeling, a feeling that's neither pleasant nor painful. And in that neutral state, if one is not observant of the feeling, then there is a tendency for delusion to arise. One becomes complacent regarding this neutral feeling if it's a state of peaceful, quiet, peaceful state a quiet, peaceful state of mind, then one becomes complacent regarding that state of mind. And one doesn't observe the arising and passing of that neutral feeling. So one doesn't see the impermanence of it. 
And in this way, delusion arises and delusion becomes strengthened. And so from this we could see that the contemplation of mind grows organically out of the contemplation of feeling. It seems to come up almost as almost as a necessary measure to protect the mind from being swept away by pleasant and painful types of feeling and from being overwhelmed without its knowledge by these unwholesome tendencies of mind. And so through contemplation of mind, one observes one's state of mind and one acknowledges what state of mind has arisen. And as I mentioned with contemplation of feeling, there are many different ways in which Satipatthana practice is undertaken. But in regard to contemplation of mind, we can mention like two ways, two general ways in which it might be utilized. One way would be as a temporary practice undertaken within a broad framework of one of the other main contemplations. So one might be doing what is prominently a body contemplation. For example, mindfulness of breathing, observance of the arising and falling of the abdomen, or one might be doing the predominantly contemplation of feeling, but intermittently one will observe one's state of mind in order to take note of what state of mind has arisen, in order to prevent certain unwholesome states of mind from unconsciously gaining momentum and thereby becoming, picking up steam and becoming major determinants of one's own character, mental temperament, without one, one's knowing it. And so one will use contemplation of mind just intermittently from time to time while one is doing predominantly a body contemplation or a contemplation of feelings. But there are other approaches to Satipatthana which use the contemplation of mind as the main method of meditation. So one might begin just to settle the mind with a short period of mindfulness of breathing, then once the mind settles down, then one will turn to the mind itself and just keep on observing whatever state of mind has arisen and then letting that state of mind go, observe the next state of mind, the next state, the next state. And within this section on contemplation of mind, the text sets up what you might call a matrix or a framework consisting of 16 possible states of mind, which are arranged in eight eight pairs. The first four pairs involve, give emphasis or prominence to unwholesome states of mind. And so within this first set of four pairs, we have the three unwholesome roots, greed or lust and its absence, hatred or aversion and its absence, and delusion and its absence. And so these three pairs set up a dichotomy, a distinction between an unwholesome state, that unwholesome state is one of the three unwholesome roots, and 
not its direct opposite, not some positive quality directly opposed to it, but simply the absence of that unwholesome quality. And so the text says, here, it begins, okay, how does a monk dwell contemplating mind as mind? Or maybe more exactly, how does he dwell contemplating mind in the mind? Here, a monk understands mind affected by lust as mind affected by lust and mind not unaffected by lust as mind unaffected by lust. Similarly, he understands mind affected by hate as mind affected by hate and mind unaffected by hate as mind unaffected by hate. He understands mind affected by delusion as mind affected by delusion and he understands mind unaffected by delusion as mind unaffected by delusion. Okay, now the actual object of focus in this contemplation is called citta, which we translate as mind. But now mind in itself is in Buddhism, it's something which is constantly changing. It's not a fixed entity like a self or a soul which always preserves a fixed quality. But citta is it's the process of cognition and it's constantly changing, always arising and falling away. And each citta, each state of mind, arises in association with a collection of mental factors. And it's these different mental factors that give the distinct color or flavor to the citta, to the state of mind. And so citta itself, we could say, is just the pure act of knowing or of experiencing. But the citta takes on its quality, its characteristics from the different mental factors with which it comes into association. So when we want to know the citta, to identify it as being of a particular type, to know what its flavor of, flavor is, on any particular occasion, we do so by way of its associated mental factors. Maybe this is a little bit like water, which is used to make a variety of drinks, flavor drinks. You can take different types of syrup, strawberry syrup, You mix it with the water and you get a strawberry drink. Blueberry syrup, you mix it with the water, you get a blueberry drink. Licorice syrup, you mix it with the water, you get a licorice flavored drink. You mix the water with um, chocolate cocoa powder, you get cocoa flavored drink. You mix it with instant coffee, you get coffee drink. And so the water has just an almost indescribable flavor in itself, but we could identify the flavor of the drink by the flavor of the syrup or substance with which the water is mixed. And so in a similar way, we identify the flavor of the citta, the mind, the state of mind, by way of the particular mental factors that that citta, that the mind is associated with. And so the Buddha uses here a particular sense he's concerned with the purification and liberation of the mind. So he uses, he takes 
those factors that are really the root factors of bondage, the root factors of mental affliction and defilement, the three unwholesome roots, greed or lust, hatred and delusion, and makes those the primary basis for the classification of the cheetahs. And so one begins by contemplating the cheetah simply in terms of whether it is associated with one of these unwholesome roots or whether it is freed from that, at least temporarily free from that unwholesome root. Okay, the fourth pair is a little bit different from the three preceding ones in that here we have two kinds of unwholesome states of mind which are opposite, contrasted, set in contrast to each other. One is called the contracted mind. The other is the distracted mind. The contracted mind, this is a mind which we can say is tight, rigid, stiff, unwieldy. It's a mind, often it's a mind which is oppressed by dullness, drowsiness. Then the opposite of this is the distracted mind. That's a mind which is afflicted by restlessness, by worry, by agitation. Okay, so in the practice of this contemplation, one will note a mind that's affected by one of these defilements, a mind which is temporarily free from the defilement. Okay, then we come to the other fair four pairs. These in these four pairs, the emphasis is upon high, what we might call higher states of consciousness, on the mind which has entered the domain of the adhichitta, the superior mind, the exalted mind. Here the text use, uses certain terms which are almost a little bit technical from the Buddhist vocabulary of higher medi- meditative states. Okay, first we have this pair, the exalted mind and the unexalted mind. Okay, the exalted mind is a mind which has gone into the range of the jhanas. An unexalted mind is a mind which has not reached the jhanic level. The commentary explains the unsurpassed or unsurpassed, actually unsurpassable mind. Again, it explains it as a mind which has reached the level of the jhanas and the surpassable mind as a mind of the ordinary kind, a non-jhanic mind. And actually it explains concentrated, unconcentrated in a very similar way (laughs) and liberated, unliberated also in a very similar way. So I have to say I don't really see on the basis of the commentarial explanation very much of a difference in in these pairs of opposite states of mind. But the commentary does say that the liberated mind here should not be understood as a mind which has reached the state of final liberation, a mind which has been permanently liberated from defilements. But rather, this means a mind which in the course of practice has been temporarily freed from the defilements through the attainment of a jhana. 
the reason the commentary says this is because this is the practice of Satipatthana aimed at the attainment of liberation. And so since this is the practice which is part of the path, it can't include recognizing the achievement of the fruit that's the liberated mind within the path. But I'm not so sure. Maybe I think the commentary might be pushing a technical distinction a little too far here, since one would think that when in our hunt is liberated in mind, he would recognize that the mind is liberated, and that would be also a part of Chitanopasana, contemplation of mind. Even though now he's not practicing the path anymore, but this is just a recognition that would come to him as a kind of contemplation of mind. Okay, and then the text continues, coming to the portion on insight. In this way, he dwells contemplating mind as mind internally. That is, one dwells contemplating one's own mind, observing the states of mind and identifying one's own states of mind. Or he dwells contemplating mind as mind externally. Again, we come across the problem I raised several times in earlier weeks. If one doesn't have the power of reading the minds of others, how can one dwell contemplating mind as mind externally? And I think the answer, the only answer that makes sense to me is that one doesn't really directly contemplate the minds of others as such, so that one doesn't read the minds of others. But in the course of contemplation, just from time to time, instead of contemplating one's own mind, one will just temporarily advert to the idea that just as states of mind, sometimes good, sometimes bad, are arising in my own mind, so in other beings, in other persons, states of mind, similar states of mind, are arising. In fact, this brings quite a broad, I call this a broad expansion of one's understanding of consciousness to think, not simply to think, but to try to experience this at the gut level to realize that other beings are experiencing the world just in a very similar way that I am experiencing it. Like maybe I come into this room and I think, okay, I have come into a room in which there's maybe, what, about 15, 20 other bodies situated. But what I also have to consider is this room and everything in it is being experienced at the same time by 15 or 20 other minds human minds. <laughs> there might be spiders in the, cob- in the cobwebs along the bottom here, other beings, unknown beings hidden away in the ceilings, in the ceiling, in the radiator, also experiencing <laughs> the room. And maybe they're thinking, what is this racket that goes on every Tuesday night? The, Can't they let us (laughs) live here in peace on Tuesday night? We don't do anything to disturb them the other (laughs) days of the week. Okay, so one contemplates mind is mind externally. Or one dwells contemplating mind is mind both internally and externally. That is, one will alternate back and forth between observing one's own mind, reflecting momentarily on the idea, the theme that others have conscious minds which are experiencing mental states similar to to one's own. Then one comes into the contemplation of the impermanence of the mind. First, contemplating in mind its nature of arising, how mind arises, consciousness arises through many conditioning factors. 
how the mind passes away or vanishes through the cessation of its conditions and even through its own nature from moment to moment. Or he dwells contemplating in mind its nature of both arising and vanishing. That is, one will be dwelling, observing both the arising and passing away of mind. And when one reaches this level, then one is no longer very much concerned with defining or identifying the particular quality of the state of mind. That is what one undertakes in the earlier stage of practice, whether the mind is with lust, with hatred, with delusion, without them. But when one enters into the contemplation of insight, then one is simply observing the mental process itself as it is arising, vanishing, arising and vanishing. If, of course, in the course of contemplation, suddenly and unexpectedly some sort of stream of lustful thoughts or angry thoughts should arise and then deflect the mind away from contemplation of, of arising and vanishing, then one will have to lay aside that contemplation of arising and vanishing and identify the state of mind and dwell with that identification until the state of mind again subsides, comes back to the balanced level, the level of meditative equipoise. Then one could return to observing the arising and vanishing of the mind. Okay, then at a certain point, one could even lay aside the contemplation of arising and vanishing of the mind and become aware simply that there is mind. Simply observing this to the extent necessary for bare knowledge and mindfulness. And so one abides, dwells independent, not clinging to anything in the world. And that is how <clears throat> a monk dwells contemplating mind as mind. Okay, now I'll ask whether there's any questions on contemplation of the mind. Dr. Mer. Um, if you use the uh, contemplation of mind as a main method of meditation, uh, are you doing then what's referred to as vipassana meditation? It is a type of vipassana meditation. In fact, most of the practices within the Satipatthana method belong to what I call the broad overview of Vipassana meditation. But I would say that the earlier exercises identifying the particular state of mind, whether it's with lust, without lust, at that point is not yet, though it's, you call it Vipassana meditation, it's more a modern term, a modern expression. Let us say that this is the preliminary phase of Vipassana meditation, where it's not yet actually developing Vipassana in the sense of the actual insights, but when it's doing the preparatory practice that will lead to the arising of the insights, or to, to the arising of insight, since it's through this called discriminative knowledge, or discriminative understanding of phenomena, that one is in, interpreting, I use the expression, interpreting the experiential field in such a way to provide a 
opening for insight to arise. But in the preliminary phase of practice, even in contemplation of mind, the main purpose is not yet to generate insight, but it is to weaken and to overcome the debilitating influence of the five hindrances, which we'll come to a little bit later in connection with the next contemplation, and to strengthen the force, the power of mindfulness and of concentration. And it's only when mindfulness and concentration, it's only when the five hindrances have been adequately suppressed, adequately overcome, and when mindfulness and concentration have reached a sufficient level of strength that the suitable foundation has been laid for the arising of insight or vipassana. But I would say that in terms of this whole formula, that the vipassana or insight arises only in the phase, starts to arise only in the phase where one dwells contemplating in mind its nature of arising, contemplating in mind its nature of vanishing, contemplating in mind its nature of both arising and vanishing. Sir, would you say that that's an analogy which we were saying before that um, Sakakana is uh, the path to permanent liberation, but not the truth itself. Yeah. We say Sakakana is the path to insight, but not the insight itself. I wouldn't. I wouldn't draw this analogy too strictly. Satipatthana is the path to final liberation, but does not include final liberation itself. But Satipatthana includes the preparatory phase for insight and the practice of insight itself. The practice of insight in the first three contemplations is primarily indicated by the passages included here that Paragraph 35 and its parallels in the earlier contemplations, paragraph 33, 35, especially the contemplation of arising, vanishing, arise, contemplation of both arising and vanishing. And the contemplation of insight becomes more prominent, especially prominent in the what's here called the contemplation of mind objects or Dhammanupassana. In fact, I would say Dhammanupassana, that last section of the sutta, that is the part of the sutta which is particularly devoted to the practice of insight meditation, to the true practice of insight meditation. Any, any further questions? Okay, then we go on to the next section. This is a section called Dhammanupassana. And here it's translated contemplation of mind objects. I don't agree with that translation <laughs> anymore. Okay, before we go into the actual text of this contemplation, let's try to find out what is meant here by dhammas in the expression, or the, by the expression dhamma, by the word dhamma in dhammanupassana. And to do this, we can just quickly take a little survey 
of the list of exercises included in this contemplation, the basic categories. We see first the five hindrances, then the five aggregates, then three, the six, what we call the six bases. These are the six inner and outer, six internal and external sense bases. Then four comes the seven factors of enlightenment. And fifth comes the four noble truths. So anything, especially um, common, what is common to these five different categories or groups? They aren't all actually mental factors. Of course, insofar as anything can be objectified by the mind, it's a mental factor. But the things like in the six sense spaces, the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, are physical things rather than mental things. That's one reason why I don't agree with the translation mind objects. Everything is conditioned. There's something common to them. Maybe that's important, but it wasn't what I had in mind. The five sets of categories. Do we come across these categories in everyday life? As categories. So where do we come across them? (laughs) Yeah. So what would you call them? They're categories of teachings. Okay, so that's one characteristic about them is that they're all categories of teachings so that they're, you could say that they're dhammas in the sense of teachings. But they're also dhammas in another sense in that one thing, if you look at them, something that you might notice about them. Another thing about them, I'll give you a little hint. You notice that these sets are all sets or groups. And what does being a group imply? Kanda is only one of the five. a group. Of what? Okay. If you look at these five sets, you notice that they're all sets or groups. And as groups, what are they made up out of? No, there's five. I'm not yet coming to that point. I want to find what's common to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. to try to understand why they might be called why this section might be called Dhammanupassana. They're all groups of what? Consciousness. 
there are other things besides consciousness. A very broad term. Excuse me? Very close, but experience is a single, singular. We have a group, you don't have a group of experience, but a group of... Other ways of categorizing these things. You're very close. <laughs> I'm trying to get a way to hit, to think of a way to hint. What makes up a group? Excuse me? Yeah. Things in the broad sense. <laughs> and things in the broad sense. In Pali, what is the word for things in the broad sense? Dhammas, yeah. <laughs> so there are sets of things or sets of to use a more technical term derived from the Greek, I think, sets of <laughs> I don't know that elements is derived from the Greek. No. Elements is close, but there's a more philosophical term. No. Begins with a P. Exactly, yeah. Phenomena. Sets of phenomena. So phenomena are what we render... Phenomena is a rendering that we often use for dhammas. So, I would say that the dhammas... Okay, dhammanopasana. We call this dhammanopasana because they take as their object first categories which are determined by the doctrine, the dham, by the Dhamma, by the Buddha's teaching, or categories of the doctrine. And then each category comprises a number of phenomena, and those phenomena are dhammas. And so, dhamma here, in Dhammanopasana, might be considered phenomena that are organized and arranged into sets of categories. And these categories are not set up at random, but they are determined by the Dhamma, that is, by the Buddha's teaching. And they are established, the categories are established because they are established in such a way as to lead to the realization of the Dhamma, the ultimate Dhamma. Excuse me? Yeah, I'm going to come to that in a moment. And so the practice of the Satipatthana is not but directed to... This is not so much and, but a qualification. The practice of the Satipatthana is not directed simply to contemplating the schemes themselves. It's not that one is out to contemplate different schemes of, cla of classification, but rather one uses these schemes of classification as doorways or gateways in order to gain perspectives on 
experience as ways to render one's experience intelligible in the light of the Buddha's teaching, in the light of the Dhamma. And so, we might say that the schemes are frameworks that make experience meaningful, comprehensible, in terms of the aim of the Dhamma. They serve as <clears throat> maps or guide guidebooks for finding our way through the twisting streets and avenues of our experience and reaching the open countryside of liberation. Okay, then if we look at the specific contemplations again, or specific exercises again, these five exercises, at first sight they might seem to be laid out almost at random. And I have to say that from what I've read from Venerable Analios, his comparative studies of the Pali Majima Nikaya with some of the versions in the Chinese uh, Tripitaka. It seems that in the most primitive or most um, archaic version of the Satipatthana Sutta, in the Dhammanupassana section, there was probably originally there were probably o- originally only two um, sections: the section on the five hindrances and the seven factors of enlightenment. And even in the Pali, the Banga, that's the book of the Abhidhamma Bhitaka, the uh, second book of the Abhidhamma Bhitaka, in the exposition of Dhammanupassana, in this chapter on Satipatthana, there are two sections in Dhammanupassana. The section on the five hindrances and the seven factors of enlightenment. So it seems that that section on Dhammanopassana, as time went on, it sort of evolved and became enlarged cumulatively. It pulled in more material into itself till it reached in its polyform five sections. But these five sections don't seem to have been pulled together arbitrarily, but one could see an intelligible pattern underlying this sequence. Okay, so I would explain the what I would call the progressive sequence or the pattern, something like this. Okay, one begins with the contemplation of the five hindrances because the five hindrances are the major barrier to the development, to the proper development of the mind. The Buddha says that they are the five hindrances are what corruptions of the mind that weaken wisdom. So they are obstacles both to samadhi to concentration, and to true insight, to panya, or vipassana, vipassana jnana, to the wisdom of insight. And so for any true insight to arise, the five hindrances have to be overcome. And that is the task dealt with in the first section. Then, Once the five hindrances are overcome, this is the clearing of the barriers, then the field opens up, or the way opens up for the exploration 
what I call the exploring the field of experience. And this is what takes place in sections two and three. One explores experience in terms of the five aggregates. And then one explores experience in terms of the six sense spaces, internal and external sense spaces. The exploration in the two cases has a somewhat different character, which I'll come to when we deal with these sections. But it is through the exploration of the investigation, the exploration of the five aggregates and the six inner and outer sense bases that insight starts to develop. Then as insight develops and starts to gain momentum, then the seven bojangas, the seven enlightenment factors, pick up momentum. They gather force. They become more prominent. You could say already from the very beginning the seven enlightenment factors are being instigated or aroused. But in the earlier stages they're still recessive. But once this exploration and investigation of the five aggregates and the sense spaces is proceeding uninterruptedly, then the seven enlightenment factors are now gaining in strength and becoming more and more decisive, um, more and more decisive powers or capacities of the mind. And then once the seven enlightenment factors become fully mature, then they will culminate in the realization or the understanding of the Four Noble Truths. And the realization of the Four Noble Truths, that is, you could say that that is the understanding of the Dhamma that comprises all the other elements of the Buddha's teaching. And so with the understanding, the penetration of the Four Noble Truths, the ultimate truth of the Dhamma itself is understood. And so we could see that in the section on the Dhammanupassana now, insight or vipassana is now being given much more prominence than in the earlier sections. Any of the earlier contemplations, body, feeling, mind, can be used as a means for the arising of vipassana. In fact, these contemplations are not mutually exclusive since one can be starting either with the body, with feeling, with mind, and then come using that as a means for focusing the mind while one is working to remove the five hindrances. But then once the five hindrances are removed, then one has to start investigating systematically all of the five aggregates or the inner and outer six sense bases. And then it is that investigation of the five aggregates, the inner and outer sense bases, that is what reveals, what fathoms the true nature of phenomena. And the true nature of phenomena, that is the true nature of dhammas. And so that is what takes place through dhammanupasana, through the contemplation of dhammas. Okay, maybe if I'll stop here and then ask if there are any questions. Any questions on what has been said so far? I understanding of the 
section is pretty much left out of the Nigi Nikaya version? The Dhamma and Upasana section? The, the, the section Four Noble Truths certainly is left out of the Nigi Nikaya version? It's actually, it's more elaborate in the Diga Nikaya version. Yeah, because the Diga Nikaya version one might almost miss the section on the Four Noble Truths because it's so elaborate that one almost doesn't see it as a section on the Four Noble Truths because it has item by item definitions of each of the terms in the First Noble Truth of explanation of what's meant by sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. Then it has a very long section on the second noble truth, where, how, when suffering arises, where does it arise? When suffering ceases, where does it cease? And that goes on for several pages. And then it has a factor-by-factor definition of the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. So my hypothesis is that that section in the Diganikaya version was originally probably a very early commentary that originated maybe in the Sangha, maybe in the Buddha's own time, maybe amongst maybe coming from a monk like Venerable Sariputta or one of the other direct disciples of the Buddha. And then it came to be incorporated into the more archaic version of the Satipatthana Sutta. But go back and look at the Diganikaya Satipatthana Sutta. You'll see that it's um, the section of the Four Noble Truths is there. Yeah. Question: When you ask us to set, uh, what what uh, in common yeah. of these five groups, yeah. when we say it's phenomena, yeah. then with the language phenomena is uh, not in any way, but it actually it is uh, human being, our existence, the life is concerning that. Um, when you say phenomena, it's like uh, there is no life there. Maybe it's because I'm too used to the use of, I'm too accustomed to the use of phenomena as a rendering for dhammas, <laughs> as meaning factors of experience within um, the special usage of phenomena as a term for rendering a Buddhist technical term. But I put in phenomena only at the very end. I just I didn't use, I didn't use that word in the question. <laughs> now you had you made a point about that the five can be divided into two. Maybe you want to explain that. Actually, I think uh, maybe we can divide into three groups. Yeah. Five hindrances. Yeah. It's uh, contemplation, which until to a certain level of concentration, at least the first time. And using this concentration to observe yeah. five petty days, six tenth days, yeah. and then it's not exploring the field of experience, but it categorizes our experiences. Yeah. So we understand what is our existence. Yeah. Existence. Yeah. And then the seven enlightenment factors mm. because of mindfulness you will divide and uh, you will be mindful and knowing uh, you will develop the second factor uh, in Dharma Vichara to divide into two groups, what is pure, what is not pure, and then we will rouse the energy. And so uh, we have two sets, what is pure and not what is, yeah. what is uh, 
not true. Mm. So, um, five aggregates, six blank spaces, it can be just a general human being's existence, mm. our experiences, and to seven enlightenment is uh, reaching towards the, the process of purification. So, where are, which are the two groups? I'm not quite sure that I see. The two groups are... Or two divisions. Five aggregates, six ten spaces. This will be... It, it can be... It is uh, not... It is uh, impure. And the seven enlightenment factors, the vulnerable two, these are pure. I see. So you divide them into two groups, impure and pure. And so you put the five hindrances, five aggregates, six sense bases in the impure category, and seven enlightenment factors, four noble truths in the pure category. Yeah. I'm not so sure about because the second noble truth is craving. <laughs> Is craving. It's a, it's a understanding, insight. It's oh, I see the cause of contemplation. Yeah. Practice. Yeah. When you are mindful and yeah. you know, yeah. and then it's a kind of insight. But then one could say that the contemplate, that the mindfulness or insight of the five aggregates, six sense bases, is also in insight. Yeah. Uh, in other sutras, when, when our sense factors, when we see something, yeah. then uh, our feeling, and then craving is there, and then you know this is yeah. something, yeah. and yeah. then you remove it. Yeah. And then this is the practicing of formal control. Mm. It is just in your mind, it's yeah. not, uh, yeah. Yeah. it's just in a moment. Yeah. Not uh, mm. like a clear theory. Yeah. Uh, this is this and this. Is. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll have to stop now and with the sharing of the merits. Akasa ta jabhuma ta deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu sa sanang Akasa ta jabhuma ta deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditva Chirang rakantu de sanang Akasa ta chabuma ta Deva naga mahitika Punyantang anumoditva Chirang rakantu mang parang Eta vata cham hehi sampadang punya sampadang Sabe deva anumodantu, Saba sampati sedia, Eta vata chaam hei sampadang punya sampadang, Sabe buta anumodantu, Saba sampati sedia, Eta vata chaam hei sampadang punya sampadang sabe satanu modantu sabha sampati sedya.